All right, so yeah. I know the Philippines knows you quite well. Uh, they're, I'm sure they're all tuning in now. Uh, so for those tuning in from Canada or the States or wherever, um, who is Diego Dario? Um, Diego Dario is just a regular guy, regular Filipino, just like everyone else who never stopped believing and achieving his dreams, basically. Like, in a short sentence, that's it. And, like, a lot of daughters were there, but then um, we just keep pushing until, like, God, God blessed me with, you know, achieving my dreams of be becoming a pro. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, you know, I've always seen you and your, you know, your public pre uh, presence as relatable and approachable. Um, obviously, behind closed doors, though, we know that your work ethic is right up there with some of the best of them. Like, to a point where it's, like, you're not, like, it would make it uncomfortable if people knew like how yeah. hard you actually work, you know, it's like your work ethic makes it so like people would probably not be as, uh, well, they, they can't see you as approachable or as relatable yeah. if they know how much you put in, right? So was there a defining moment in your career that created that fire under you? Or was that something that you've always had like that innate switch, you know, where it's always like, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to kill. Um, I would say uh, there was one point, but then I would usually like, uh, think of ways to motivate me to work harder than like ever. So, but the first ever, that first ever event that happened in my life is when I got cut during my first year in high school. So, um, and the reason was, it's, it wasn't even because the, the last man was better than me. It was because um, he was older. He was, because that's the thing in the Philippines, bro. Like, if you're older, like, you usually get, get it first, right? So, yeah. I was I was so like pissed like when I find found out after practice I just stayed in the court for like three hours until my dad picked me up like usually my dad doesn't pick me up so when my dad picks me up I know it's like I gotta go home I gotta go so home. like that's the, that was my first reaction was to like work hard so I was I was crying after that finding out that I wasn't part of the team uh, the UAAP team in the high school division so that was a, that was big for me that was one of my dreams mm -hmm. um during that time so. My dad talked to me, he was like, if you really want to make it, make sure next year they don't have any reason to cut you. Yeah. So yeah. that's stuck in my, that, that, that was like just in my mind for that whole year. So what I did was like, I did everything right. So I ate right. I skipped chips, no chips, no, no soda, um, ate healthy. Uh, I made sure that I could get work in before school. So in UPIS, school started at 7 a.m. So I had to wake up at 5 to get, you know, my morning run in, um, to get a little skills in before class. And then I had to wake up at, I don't know, sleep at around 8 or 9 so I, that I could get 8 hours of sleep because I wanted to grow. Yeah. So, like, from that point on, for one whole year, I did everything right. Like, did my homework right away so that I could sleep early. Um, did extra work after class, not even with the team. Like, literally, you know, CHK had two courts, right? Mm -hmm. So they would train in the first court, I think, before you guys. I would literally train in the second court because I'm not allowed to train with them. So I would just be, like, doing skills al alone by myself or, like, with other CHK people. And then for a whole year. So I, I would train twice a year, every twice a day, every day. And then from 5'1", I grew like six inches in a year because like I, I got like eight to nine hours of sleep every single night. So from that point on, I was like, okay, like if this works, this is going to work every single time. Yeah. So that's what I did the whole, like every time. So the next year, I was basically like the top point guard right away. And then from that point on, it just... It just my career just went up. Um, got invited to the national team. Uh, once I got like you know, good games in the UAAP, and then it just like skyrocketed from there. Man, so, so basically, that's it. That's man, the, no, that's like one event. But then there are a lot of events. Like let's say when my dad passed away, that that was like an extra fire. Um, when there was a time in college that I wasn't getting a, a lot of minutes because we had a new coach. So I had to like prove it. Actually, with all coaches, I really had to prove a lot because like because of my height. So yeah. basically, I I learned that from MJ too. Like he he gets a lot of motivation in stuff that 
other people don't get a lot of motivation. Yeah, you got to find right? it. Yeah. Trying to find it. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I hear you. And, and man, so, like, what would you say then? Because a lot of coaches, a lot of players, um, a lot of parents, they say that, you know, the best way to get better is to play. You didn't because you didn't make the team. So yeah. all you did for that one year, like you said, was train twice a day and you did everything to form and mold your schedule around being able to train twice a day and get that rest needed to recover for the next day and the next day for the next 365 days, right? What would you say kind of like in relation to, you know, playing versus training? How important mm -hmm. is it and what age does that become or what age does it become more important to train versus more important to play? Or do you think there has to be a balance in it? And were you playing during that time that you got cut? Um, I think there would be a balance. Like, okay, during the, um, like when classes were still there, so it's not summertime yet. I would just yeah. do skills and a lot of, you know, conditioning. I would like play pickup here and there. But during the summer, I think that's where I really like got all my confidence to go into the next year because during the summer i joined if you know this jay like there are a lot of village leagues barangay leagues the barangays. Like, that's a, yeah like that's where i honed my skills like you're playing with men that's too, where right? i am huh you're playing with men right yeah like older barangay, people yeah. Like, probably like five six years older than me but for yeah. sure they didn't have like proper training right so it was just like street ball yeah. but then that's when i got my confidence of like okay i worked hard and now I'm going to apply it. And I'm like, okay, next year, I'm going to play with, like, people my age. So I'm going to be, like, so much better than them. So I think that you sh there should be a balance. But if you really want to, like, let's say you want to work on something, like, let's say shooting or, like, your dribbling, for sure, drills and skills would really work and really, like, you got to be patient with it until, like, after a time, you would actually, like, apply it in the game. So I think there should be, be a balance depending on your program. I th I'm sure you know that, Jay, like, mm -hmm. um, block training and, like, randomized training, right? Like, like when you just keep doing reps and then it evolves to, like, um, reaction drills and then it becomes, like, game-like. Specific, so, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> happy we, we were able to dig into that so now one of the reasons why i asked you to come on the show is because of how similar you are to the young hoopers that i train um a lot of them will sadly not reach you know they won't reach the six five six seven and, and above yeah. um and those that are blessed with height early like the, the ones that are like six four six five now um they be their forwards or centers because just out of necessity for the team um but then you know they end up having transition their game because they grew too early so now they have to become a six five seven forward center but transition to become a guard because they capped out too early yeah. right so can you take me through like the early stages of being an undersized player when you were younger but or, or sorry the early the early struggles of being undersized when you were younger um i think honestly like i just got used to it being undersized so like the adjustment period was early in my career so i think even just in grade school, I was undersized already. So um, to me, I took it as an advantage because I really can't control my height. Like, to be honest, like no, all the coaches here, you can't teach height. Like, no. you, yeah, yeah, you can train, but you can't teach height. Yeah. So like for me, at a young age, I knew it was my advantage because like, especially in basketball, you know, the saying, um, when you're lower, you're faster. Yeah. Like I'm lower to the ground. So mm -hmm. I'm faster than everyone else since like since grade school so for me i took it as an, an advantage and then from that point on I, I i thought to myself like okay what should i master since like because i'm small so i mastered like finishing around the rim finishing high on the on the finishes um my pull-up jumper you know that like that was my go-to oh yeah but then going into college as an undersized and everyone was like growing taller and taller I had to work on my three-point shot, like long range, longer range, since like I can't really go to that mid-range spot since everyone's like taller already in college. So I had to work on that range and then eventually it just translated to the pros. But then like being undersized is really like a challenge. Like I would not lie. It's really a challenge because like especially with um, the coaches, you know, thinking about you like, okay, he's going to be a liability on defense. Um, let's say there is always going to be a mismatch. Um, he can't see over the defense and stuff like that. So there's always this um, 
you guys you always got to prove something especially like if you have a new coach and you're undersized and like smaller than all the other players he's got to see that like fire he's got to see that you work hard you love the game and being a leader too like you got to make your um presence be felt because it's different when you're like six eight and you do like a jumper and like a like let's say you dunk like everyone's gonna be like oh like he's gonna be great but then like let's say a five five foot eleven player <laughs> yeah hit a three it's gonna be all right that's normal like it's he's probably not gonna do that, that in the games like yeah. yeah so you gotta you got it's an extra push for you if you're undersized so i think that's that's the challenge for being undersized right so kind of like digging into that um how hard was it for you to to kind of not really evolve because you you were always quick you were always able to take your man dribble and when you were able to do that that's when you settled into your pull-up jumpers yeah now bringing that into the pros that rookie year like did you find any struggles with that or did you feel like even now like do you feel like you have played so long given your height and being so used to these mismatches has it even been a transition or is it more so now just the transition into the pros that everybody gets, whether you're five five or you know, seven seven feet? Um, I think like a lot of what a lot of people like um, miss. I mean, like don't know when they get to the pros. Like uh, when you get to the pros, like your skills are actually like like pro level. Like like when you get there, like you everyone's like on the same level. So you wouldn't re- re- really realize that you're like um, super skilled because everyone's like skilled like you, right? right? So the differences in the pros was reading the game. Okay. So, so in college, in high school, you could just get away with your skill, with like making baskets. But the pro, my biggest adjustment was wasn't really the size because there's there were a lot of um, point guards my size too, but. Since I, I, I'm used to playing small all the way from grade school to, to the pros, it wasn't really an adjustment. So probably I had to adjust with point guards posting me up. You know, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <bigger laughs> there would be like 6'2", like 6'1", six, six, point guards here. Like Saul Mercado, like um, James Forrester. He used to yeah. post me up. Like, he still plays. He knows you. Right? He always, like, tells me, like, hey, like, let Jerry know, like I said, what's up. But then, like they they would post me up literally, so I had to find ways to, you know, like how to defend that. Um, I had to ask my vets, like, oh, what do you do when people post you up and stuff like that. So that's probably one of the uh, small adjustments. But the biggest adjustments was really reading the game. Okay. Because these people are longer, so the passes aren't always there. So you gotta make sure, like, you know. You could pass with one hand, one hand hook passes and stuff like that, or like um, passing ahead to the roller, like reading a step ahead and stuff like that. Because since everyone's bigger and longer, it's not just a simple pass. Like let's say in college, like you can just put that pocket pass or like a kick out. Yep. Now you gotta adjust it. Like let's say a no look pass is really like effective and needed in the pros because you gotta like fake them with your eyes now. It's not just in the in college level. You could just pass it, and then it would go through. So yeah. stuff like that, stuff like that was my biggest adjustment in reading the game. Which um, reading film was really my biggest adjustment in um, pr- the pros too. Knowing what's who's gonna be open during these cer- cer- certain situations, um, what shots are gonna be available and stuff. So it's crazy that when I went to the pros, there was still another level. Like I think that's that's one of the biggest like key takeaways. Like there's all like I thought when I got to the pros, okay, I'm just gonna play. Yeah. But then there was like another level, then another level. Like it's crazy how basketball is just like that. It's you just never stop learning. Yeah, it's it's like if, if I feel like when you stop learning or when you start thinking that you know everything or you think you're you know you're good enough, that's when you you know you're gonna start seeing your yeah, goals, bro. right. That is true. Yeah. So, no, that's that, that's that, that's awesome that you, that you brought that up, man. So now, like on top of the being undersized, we went over a lot of the adjustments that you had to go through with mainly the, um, the 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 size difference with the posting up and now reading how to get your teammates open. Um, you were also obviously underrated, uh, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Not a lot of people like 
you don't pass the look test, right? That look test is, you know, coach walks into the gym, you know, we're at, we're at an open tryout. Okay, I'm looking, am I looking at the five, 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 seven kid, or am I looking at the six, three, six, four guy? Obviously, your yeah. eyes are going to gravitate towards that guy, right? <laughs> yeah. For those that are having a hard time with standing out at those trial situations, uh, or when they're actually, you know, in that game situation, um, trying to earn the coach's trust, is there any, uh, you, you already dug into it, but is there anything more that you feel like, you know, players that are undersized and, you know, all automatically underrated, is there anything more they can do to help kind of boost their, their stock? Oh, that's for sure. Um, like I said, I'm literally like every single Filipino out there. Like, every, like when you go to a tryout, everyone's like me. Yeah. <laughs> like 5'7", five, 5'8", five, point guard who can dribble. Yeah. Right? So I think for people who are underrated and like um, people who are like normal, I would say normal because like usually basketball players are athletic freaks and like every and tall and everything. Yep. I, I would say like be vocal. Okay. Like when, when we played, I was really vocal, Jay, like on defense, on offense, always, like always. when people, when people would make shots, I was already there like, you know, like, yeah, good job, man. Yep. And then like, even on defense, I was just so noisy, like, I got help. I got. Help. I would push people to the help side and stuff like that. And that, people and coaches see that. Coaches see that. Coaches see your leadership. So I think you got to be a little extra with that, to be honest. If you want to get noticed. Okay. So first of all, that being vocal. Second is probably um, being a leader. So talking to your teammates. You know when when they did something wrong, or like let's say when they did something right, you commend them, or let's say when you saw something that could probably work you can tell your teammates and i was i was really like that in college and high school like i would tell people okay you're going to be open in this certain situation mm -hmm. so that so being vocal being a leader and working hard dude like being <laughs> yeah. there early like two hours early and staying there two done. hours after like you know this jay like yeah. um i would try to beat you on the court <laughs> before we start <laughs> to be honest like i was like ah jay is already here like why like, I why? set up my, my class schedule. That's why. Like, I made it so, like, I had all my classes, like, 8 a.m. till I think it was 12 or 1 or, or something. Like, I, as much as possible, I try to do that. Just so, you know, I, there would be times I go to, like, the Gold's Gym before classes, before that first class. And then, so I know yes. I can get my skills in before practice starts. But the thing with us, man, like, our court was just such a, a pain. Because, like, <laughs> it rained. Our court was, like, the it was just, it was bad. It was worse. Like, people, right? like it was dripping and all. Yeah, but man, you, it's just like, like you said, you got to find a way, man. Like if you really want it, if you really, 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 you know, have that dream and that goal, yeah. it's like whether, like, again, whether you're your height, my height or taller, or bigger, whatever, man, like yeah. it's the same thing. Like I, I like using Steph Curry because Steph Curry grew up with an NBA dad. Like he grew up around NBA players like Vince Carter and him are close. Like, yeah. And then you have the LeBron James where he grew up with nothing. He doesn't even know his dad. And, and he has, you know, him and his mom lived on poverty and he became who he is. Like, you got these two backgrounds where, you know, either one, like Steph could have got lazy. He could have coasted. LeBron could have used his background to be in trouble. Right. But end of the day, it was like, it's just the work ethic. Right. I think that's yeah. a big differentiating factor between athletes of all levels, of all sizes, whatever it is. Right. So, you know, it's funny you brought that up because, man, like, the hardest thing sometimes was getting the ball boys to rebound. Like, they, they just didn't want to. And, like, man, like, I don't know how, like, how, how you thought I was living out there. Yeah, I had the condo and everything. But, like, I also didn't want to pay, like, the 50 to 100 pesos, like, every time. Yeah, bro. Because, man, like, if I do it once, then I, I kind of have to do it every time. And yeah. I, I needed them to rebound, like, all the time. So, it's like, yeah. you know, Kuya, you, you down to help today? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. And they weren't getting paid enough, too, that time. And then, yeah. but during my time, like, my senior year, like, Everyone would just rebound for you because, like, they know they would get paid and all. But then, yo, just a side story. Like, um, when I was in high school, there was a time, like, I, I was like, okay, I, I'm, like, one of the best high school players in the country. So, I think I'm going to get recruited. I'm going to be, like, one of the best college players. And then I saw you because um, we would train, like, court two, court one. You guys would train court one. I, I would see you freaking, like, you were there two hours before practice. And then, like, even, like, two, three hours after. So I'm like, 
like this guy works hard, harder than me. Like, so like, <laughs> to be honest, like I was so competitive, like I was like, okay, I got to work harder than this guy when I get to college. Like, so like, you didn't even know that, that you inspired me and like motivated me to like work even harder. Cause I was, I was ready to like be confident and like, you know, slack off and be like, I'm the star. But then, you know, seeing like a college player, someone ahead of you working as hard as that. So I'm like, okay, this work is not going to stop until I get like to the pros. Mm -hmm. So this is a sad story. So no, I appreciate yeah. that, man. For real. I appreciate that a lot. I checked off that. But, uh, <laughs> I have, you got that stuff off your, off our chest, man. I appreciate you uh, for, for opening that up. Um, but man, like, you know, talking about the mental, emotional and the physical barriers, has there ever been any more of like mental and emotional challenges being someone undersized and underrated? Has it ever, have you ever gone home after like a trial, for example, and just kind of like broken down with your parents thinking, man, like, I know I'm better than everybody, but like my height or just because I'm not ranked better than these people, like I'm not, I know I'm not going to get the same opportunity as them. Like, has that ever been an issue for you? For sure, bro. Like it's all it's it's always at the back of my mind. Like I would question, like, okay, why am I even at this level at in this sport if like I have all these challenges every day? Like I'm underrated, under over, un undersized. So like there was one point in college too, like when we changed coaches. Uh, I think it was the second year. Like that was my mo had, that, For me, I had five coaches in the five years I was there. Yeah, I had three, bro. So, like, Yo. I, I'm kind of blessed with that. So, <laughs> um, I would say, I would say, like, there was one time in college where um, I had the fewest minutes in my career. Like, I, I would have DNPs even. So, these are things that I couldn't control. But, like, some games we would win. So, I couldn't complain. I right? Because we were, we were winning, right? So, yep. like... That, that was the time I was like, okay, I think it's done. Like, <laughs> like I think I'm done playing ball since, like, there's no way, like, scouts will see me since I get so, like, little playing time. I was blaming a lot of people, blaming my coach, um, blaming, like, my teammates and everything, everyone else. Like, but there was this one time I saw, I met a coach. Um, he's my skills trainer now, Coach Pat. So he's, like, he, he became, like, a mentor for me. Um okay. He introduced me to like a lot of you know sports psychology, um, meditation. So like he basically told me to control what I can control, and even if like I'm not getting enough playing time, what did you do like when you were in first year high school? You just worked. So like he brought me back to that um, mindset of you know like I wasn't even supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. Like so, what are you gonna do? Right. So like I, I really appreciate people like that. I think it's God's plan too, like the timing. Like during that time I was at a low point of my career and then I met someone who would like inspire me, um, get work in with me at six AM and at like ten PM every day and would introduce me to a lot of like um drills, a lot of mental drills. So I started getting to meditation, like I would do it every morning. I started five three minutes, then five minutes. Then I, now I'm doing 15 minutes every morning and nice. at night too before I sleep. So that really like helped me stay in the moment. For me, that's because, dude, Michael Jordan stayed, stayed in the moment. Yep. So <laughs> you got to do what you got to do to mm -hmm. stay in the same moment. Because like what happens when you think about the past and you think about the future, you get anxiety for mm -hmm. sure. Because like these are things you can control. Um, these are things that, you know, like, you never know, like, you can't control the past, and you'll never know what's going to happen in the future, right? Yep. So, like, meditation kept me in check of, like, okay, yeah, you have emotions, yeah, you, you're you feeling that way, you have doubts, but when you go deep inside you, like, when you do meditation, it's like, all right, I'm in depression, what am, what am I going to do with my current situation? So, that's what I did. So, um... Then think about what coach was thinking. Then think about what fans, what supporters were saying, because they were telling me like, they were like, uh, he, he's having a downfall. He's like, his career is over and stuff no. like that. Yeah. So like, I just stayed in the moment. So I'm just thankful for for people that I meet that you know introduced me to that. And then now I'm in the pros. 
how how big of a factor basketball has made to to who Diego Dario is right now. Um, I think it's just like what I've been through, like with the game of basketball. Like for me, basketball is a. To be honest, I think any other sport, but then but for me, bas- that 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 was basketball. Basketball is like life. To be honest, like <laughs> you meet a lot of people, you meet a lot of different people. Like same with life, you meet a lot of people, different kinds. Um, you even travel because of basketball, so you meet so much more people. And then you have challenges in basketball. You have goals. You have goals in basketball as well as in life. That I wanted to get better and get over that hump. So, just an just an additional story. When I met my trainer, um, Better Basketball, that's his Instagram. But he's Coach Pat to me. Um, he did. He didn't just introduce me to the mental aspect. So like meditation and sports psychology. He introduced me to a lot of people like nutritionist here in the Philippines and like taking strength and conditioning because you know this Jay like strength and conditioning isn't just doing like random workouts Mm -hmm. like you got to program it like you know like before the season so that you peak into the season so like I met a lot of these people that helped me improve in so much different aspects and not just basketball so it's about taking care of my body um, eating the eating the right stuff making sure my mind is right, and then basketball. Yeah. So, like, the maturity came from the setbacks, but then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be that mature and, like, thinking about all these stuff if I didn't meet the people that wanted to help me. So, you know, you and I both know that, you know, the work ethic, the, the passion, the persistence, consistency, a lot of things that we talked about, all of that's easier said than done. But, you know, uh, our, our last point here before we go through the comment section, you know, if you could give advice to the young aspiring athletes or even, you know, if you could talk to, you know, 12-year-old Diego Dario, uh, what would you say? Like one piece of advice that you feel like would be the most important thing to tell these young athletes that are, you know, whether they're undersized, underrated, or just going through it mentally, physically, and especially during this time of quarantine. For me, um, probably like my biggest advice is keep going, yo. Like, like to my 12-year-old self, I would say just keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. But then on a serious note, like, I would say don't let other people's opinion, like, dictate your actions, to be honest. Like, I, I had so much reasons to quit, to not play basketball because of what other people are saying. Like, they were, they were telling me, like, um, you're too small to play UAP high school division. You're, and then they were telling me you're, okay, yeah, you're good in high school, but then you're too thin, and you, you you're too thin for the college division. Yeah. And then when it came to the to the pros, they're like, it's always something. Nah. Yeah, it's, there's always something like always. that people are gonna say. So like, you just can't di- like let other people dictate your actions. Like if you really want it, if you really like, is this just really your dream? The opinions won't matter, to be honest. So, like, to all the people out there, like, trying to achieve dreams, like, people, when people are pulling you down, like, don't even, like, acknowledge it. Like, yeah. surround, you, surround yourself with people who uplift you, people who want to, like, see you succeed. So, I'm really grateful for all the trainers. Like, you, bro, like, um, honestly, if I'm not a pro basketball player, I would be a trainer, too. Because oh, I want to, yeah. like, because I want to, like, you know, inspire people to, like, keep going. Like, that's why I'm so thankful to the trainer that I met um, back in, like, third year high school. Because, like, it was just a really perfect time that I met him. Mm-hmm. Right? So, that's you it, bro. Like, keep someone. going. Yeah, that's it. Like, keep that. Those are probably my three advice. Like, keep going. Um, don't, like, let other people's opinions dictate your actions. And, like, be grateful for the people that that you, like, all the people that you're with. Yeah. So just be grateful and surround yourself with positive people. Like, that you yeah. don't know, like, how important that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I love it, man. Um, well, man.